All right, welcome everybody to another show today. I have a superhero in the natural health field, in the environment, on the show. His name is Jeffrey Smith, and he has single-handedly, pretty much, started the GMO movement, started the awareness. He was named the 2017 Person of the Year by Masters of Health magazine. His research has exposed how the biotech companies have misled policymakers, misled the public, and put the health of our society and the environment at risk. I hope that you've heard of GMOs by now. I hope that you've been aware of all of the damage that not only genetically modified organisms, but also the atrazine and the glyphosate and all the pesticides and herbicides have been damaging the internal system as well as the environment. One of my favorite documentaries is Genetic Roulette, and Jeffrey was awarded the 2012 Movie of the Year and the Transformational Film of the Year Award. And today we're gonna to talk about genetically engineered foods. We're gonna talk about what to look out for in the future. We might even get into some detoxification. All of the symptoms that you, your family members might be experiencing and might not even know about with the consumption of GMOs, or for that matter, glyphosate or any of the other BT toxin, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I wanna mention that in 2018, Jeffrey and Amy Hart released Secret Ingredients, which is a documentary that highlights numerous individuals and families that have been healed. That's what we're all about, teaching people how to heal themselves from serious conditions after switching to an organic GMO herbicide-free diet and lifestyle. So, Jeffrey, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you on today. Why is it so important that people pay attention to their diet and to GMOs? Thank you, Ed, and um, that's a great setup. It's like throwing me a slow softball catch and I can hit it out of the park. Why is it important? Well, I think that I'm gonna divide it into two answers. Uh, and in the second part, we can talk about the 28 different diseases and disorders that people said they got better from when they switched to a non-GMO and organic diet. We can talk about the more than 30 diseases that are rising in parallel with the increased use of GMOs and Roundup in the United States. We can talk about how pets and livestock also reverse their health problems when they get on a non-GMO organic diet. We can even talk about the modes of action of GMOs and Roundup and BT toxin, which is found in the corn. And that is going to be <clears throat> kind of a wake-up call for people to realize, <clears throat> oh my God, I had no idea. I had no idea that so much of my physiology, so much of my torment for so many years could be flipped in one stroke by switching to organic. However, I'm gonna put that on hold, tease it, <laughs> and talk about something else about why is GMOs important. And I usually wait for the end of the lecture as kind of an afterthought and saying, by the way, while you're eating non-GMO, you're also saving the environment and all living beings and all future generations. And you know, when I just said all living beings and all future generations, people may think that was superlative. Let me tell you, Ed, it is not. Right now, the number one priority of the biotech industry is to try and push out the new GMOs created from gene editing around the world without any required safety assessments, without any labeling, without consumers even knowing but it's not just in food, it's in bacteria, algae, fungus, trees, everything with DNA is up for grabs. And there's three things to know about. One is that once you release these things in the environment, they cannot be recalled from the gene pool. It becomes passed on to all future generations of that species and sometimes it crosses species. Second, the number one most common result of genetic engineering is surprise side effects. Third, there are tens of thousands of labs, some run by artificial intelligence and robotics that can pump out vast numbers in this generation. So if we are not careful, 
we may not pass on to future generations the products of the billions of years of evolution that we inherited. We may pass on a nature that has been replaced by laboratory creations where the chances of not just a disaster, but a cataclysm are approach 100% as you increase the number of organisms out there, the number of interactions, and the permanence of that introduction. Wow. What, uh, if someone is not too familiar with GMOs or genetic and engineering, let's say, versus genetic modification, where do they, I mean, tell us about your site a little bit and what you're going through and how they can get more information. And then we can go into more detail because I, to me, this is such a vital area that everybody needs to know about. When you're talking about editing genes, like you said, or you're talking about genetically modified things. I mean, you look at the effects on the environment, and I'd like for you to even get into some of the studies that show infertility and how that can affect seven generations uh, into the future. But first off, if someone's just new to this, where can they go to get more information? And by the way, if, they're, if someone is struggling with fertility issues, bookmark that. Don't leave this conversation. There's an amazing fact I'm gonna share in just a minute from the film Secret Ingredients that is mind blowing. So don't let me forget this. So we, you know, for 23 years, I've been focusing on introducing the health dangers of GMOs and Roundup, inspiring people to change their diet, initiating a tipping point of consumer rejection in the marketplace in the United States so that more and more food companies are responding to the 46% of surveyed Americans that say they're seeking non-GMO food. But now for the first time in our history, we're reframing the world debate about GMOs. Yeah, we'll talk about the health dangers, but this is absolutely essential. I spoke at six or five or six uh, conferences, one with you at TTAC and others, and asked the audience, usually before I played a three minute video, at, which you can see at protectnaturenow.com. Before I played that three minute video, I said to the audience at the very beginning, if climate chaos is an eight out of 10, where would you rate the threat to the planet from GMOs? And I was expecting people to rate it quite a bit lower and the majority rated it more dangerous. And that happened at a climate conference. It happened at an environmental conference. It happened at a health conference. It happened at Bioneers just now. So we have a situation where people already realize the threat of GMOs is a exist, an existential threat. Now, what we're doing at the Institute, if you go to protectnaturenow.com, you can watch that three minute film, which I shared on stage that you saw. And there's a social media action campaign to help spread it. There's links at the bottom for, for, for further information. And what it does is it acts as the wake up bell saying, guess what? There's a new threat on the block. And we, if we don't do something immediately, I mean immediately, it can be pushed out before we know it and we've lost nature. Even if we stop all the other major existential threats, we still may lose nature. Now, it's not just the biotech industry that's rallying. In the video, I describe how the Trump administration signed an executive order on June 11th that mandated essentially the stripping out of regulatory reviews for most GMOs and empowered and charged the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Agriculture, the US Trade Representative, the Commissioner of the FDA, the Administrator of the EPA to all work together to create a plan to essentially eliminate regulations around the world, convince the consumers of the world to accept US made gene edited products. And USAID just announced that they're gonna spend $70 million investing in global agricultural initiatives. So the entire machinery of this government is moving forward with the biotech agenda, as is the governments of Brazil and Argentina and Chile and Japan and others. And the, the myth is that this new gene editing, which they say, oh, it shouldn't even be called the GMO, it should be called breeding. Well, there's a ton of information and you can go to the site and read some of it, where you take these little molecular scissors and you cut the DNA, but what can happen when it gets rejoined by the cellular mechanism? It can recruit 
uh, retroviruses and jumping genes and bacterial genes and antibiotic resistant genes, and it can create mutations and deletions. It can create over a thousand point mutations up and down. We're talking massive collateral damage and a system which is designed to create unpredictable side effects. And so if we think about what could go wrong from the stage, you may remember I talked about in the early 90s, there was a genetically engineered bacteria that was about to be spread all over the North America, and it could have theoretically rendered our soils infertile. And we know bacteria could spread around the world. It could have rendered soils infertile around the world. There's another bacteria in the late 80s that it near missed. It could have changed the bacteria's structure so it did not condense water. That bacteria is used in the air over California to condense the moisture coming from the ocean, creating rains. It could have changed global weather patterns. There's so much, in, I mean, one single bacterium, one species can wreak that kind of havoc. And now the biotic industry wants to create a plan to customize soil microbiomes per farm and create all like thousands or tens of thousands of different varieties and release them. And what can go wrong? It's imagination that would lead us what can go wrong. And we never want to find out. So I'd like to recommend go to protectnaturenow.com and people will say, what can we do? The Institute for Responsible Technology, we're a nonprofit. We're creating a bundle of solutions. We're curating, co collaborating, creating materials. And we are looking for other groups and leaders who are already involved with environmentalism, or involved with planetary survival, to adopt this message. And we need some help. So where we need help most is money. So if you can make a donation at responsibletechnology.org, if you can make a donation there, then we can then have the momentum to do what we need. And, and the momentum is happening today. Uh, Good Earth Natural Foods is as a 3% day. They're giving 3% of everything that they sell to the Institute for Responsible Technology, hosting me for a, for a fundraiser. Um, there's different groups that are bringing me on. They realize that they may not be able to drop everything, travel around the world to 45 countries like I have, give lectures, speak about this, create materials, but we can. But we're also at a kind of our own existential crisis with, with money. So we need to keep the lights on and expand in order to make this happen. So I just wanted to give that pitch that there is something we can do. And for most people, it's to contribute and ideally on a recurring basis so that we have, the, we have the means to then hire and create and budget and actually turn this thing around. It's, uh, I wish we could rely more on the government to, to, <laughs> to look out for our, for our health. But if you look back at history, and I have this conversation with people all the time, it's like all the changes that have happened have happened from grassroot, grassroots efforts. Or it just took one individual or a group of individuals to bring forth you know, their concerns. And then ultimately, when enough people get behind it, the government actually does something about it. What do you think the main you know, the main purpose of all of this GMOs, this genetic editing is, and this plan to completely destroy the soil. And is it just that they want to patent every single thing? It's like, it's like in the Bible, it talks about sin. And, and if you look at all of the things that are destroying the environment, and for that matter, destroying the body, most of them are synthetic compounds. And it's, <laughs> nice, well said. So you have all these man, like we're trying to play God and you have all these synthetic ingredients. And years ago, I took pharmaceuticals and I broke them down in the body and, they, and realized that all they're doing is causing more damage and they're causing things to be stopped or biochemistry to be halted. And it's, it's not doing any good. And now you look at all the water systems around the world that have been completely contaminated, not only from pharmaceutical runoff, but from glyphosate runoff and all these chemicals and heavy metals and all of these synthetic man-made compounds. Is it just that the big companies want to control the food supply or they, I mean, do they not know the damage that they're causing? You know, it's interesting. They, they, certainly have an idea. I talked to a former Monsanto scientist and he said that three of his colleagues were testing the milk from the cows treated with their genetically engineered bovine growth hormone. And the Monsanto scientists 
found so much cancer promoting hormone in the milk, IGF-1, that they decided to not drink milk again because they could not expose their own bodies to it. They would drink organic, one bought his own cow, but they would not drink the milk that was in the marketplace because of their own company's intervention with a cancer promoting drug. They also, this person also told me that when they fed genetically engineered corn from Monsanto to rats, there was so much damage to the rats, instead of withdrawing the corn, they rewrote the study to hide the effects. So they are aware, in fact, you know, I, I look at the data that was mined from these Monsanto trials that they lost because their Roundup caused cancer. And it is clear they had world experts brought in. Dr. Perry, does Roundup or does glyphosate cause cancer? Does it cause oxidative stress and genotoxicity? His report, yes. They buried the report. Ghost wrote their own review paper that said exactly the opposite. When they wanted to show that Roundup could pass the EPA's required level for not enough absorption into the skin. Well, it was 10% absorption, 3.3 times the legal level. So instead of doing and submitting that data, they cut cadaver skin off, put it in the oven, baked it till it was overdone, put it in the freezer, froze it so it was leather-like, put it the Roundup on it, it could not penetrate, and said, see, hardly any absorption. Totally caught red-handed lying. So they do know about the problems and they're pushing it forward anyway. So when you talk about a bigger agenda, um, controlling the world's food supply is a big peach. I mean, like, that's, that's huge. It's a bigger, bigger uh, overall amount of money than any other category. But there's also control. Someone told me they spoke to a US government representative before GMOs were introduced and said, we need other countries to introduce GMOs so we can control their food supply. This is from a military and security standpoint. And they said, well, aren't we going to be using GMOs too? Oh yeah, we have to use it here so that we're demonstrating to the rest of the world that they should accept it. So this is one conversation, secondhand, don't know if it's true, but it's an interesting concept. Another person, he told me direct, he accidentally hacked into a website in the mid seventies and read that the CIA, uh, Monsanto and I believe the USDA were working together to create termination seeds that they can drop in other countries and turn off the harvest essentially so that they could force the country to, you know, basically kowtow to US interests. So he did this on a phone modem, you know, from his high school. He was called into the office a few days later and there were some men in suits around and they were from the CIA. He did not know at the time that he had hacked in accidentally to the CIA website and they wanted to know what he had said and he had to sign papers that he could not repeat what he had said and he said he could finally talk about it because he saw the whole thing on nova a few years ago but no one can get that episode anymore and this termination technology was created where you can create seeds that have no viable offspring to be replanted and there's certain things you can that will turn off the fertility if you spray it with certain chemicals or wait to the chemicals to turn it on you can control uh, harvests that way. Now, these are theories about a another level. Of course, the, de the Defense Department is using gene editing. They want to create genetically engineered insects that can do gene editing in the field by inserting viruses. They have all sorts. I mean, it gets so mind-boggling what's going on right now uh, with a potential genetically engineered future. But it's not, even if there are dark players in it, I would have to say, Ed, that this is an inevitable time in the development of human civilization where we have the tools to tinker in the DNA inexpensively in garages for, you know, once you have this set up, price of dinner for doing a particular gene edited product. And we have people who are bright eyed and want to help the world. The, the, the bacteria that almost destroyed the fertility of the soil in North America was designed to help farmers turn agricultural stubs into alcohol to run their tractors. It had a great motivation. So it's not like everyone doing gene editing is on the wrong side of the situation. It is a natural outcome. What is, what is important is now that we have the tools to do damage to all living beings and all future generations, we have to sort of huddle and say, where are we going to go with this? And so that's what we need to do is to create that global huddling and protection of our species and all species. 
Yeah, one of the things that bothers me is it's so clandestine, it's so secret. And, you know, I talk to people about GMOs and genetic engineering, and they're like, what's the difference? And in, in what, why, in your opinion, why, can you explain the difference between GMO and genetic engineering and, and what that has to do with label requirements and and the push for GE versus GMO in the future and what people need to be aware of? So part of the way to control the narrative is to control the language. And the biotech industry has purposely tried to confuse the language. For years, genetic modification, genetic engineering were the same thing. They were typically transferring genes from one species into another species. You'd use a gene gun and literally shoot millions of genes into a plate of millions of cells, or you use bacteria to infect it and then clone the cells and it would cause massive collateral damage and all sorts of unpredicted side effects. Now there's a new uh, form of GMOs where you go in with molecular scissors and you edit within the DNA, which can also create massive collateral damage. We refer to all of that as genetic modification and genetic engineering. The biotech industry comes in and their first attempt to confuse us and say, well, Genetic modification, that's any time you change the gene. So crossbreeding, beer, fermentation, all these things are genetic modification. We're saying, oh no, they're just taking, trying to over, you know, overtake the messaging. And then the, the concept is, oh, it's just an extension of natural breeding. We've been genetically modifying for centuries. And so they, because they change the language, it's easier to change the concept, even though the FDA's own scientists, when you look at the actual memos made public from a lawsuit, said, no, 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 no. Genetic engineering and natural breeding are totally different, totally different risks. We need to test. We need to, there's toxicological problems, allergy problems. And what happened? The person in charge of the policy, their superior, Monsanto's former attorney, which should give you an idea, Monsanto's the big biotech company. And the, the, the policy came out denying the existence of their concerns saying there's no there's we know of no information showing any difference therefore no testing or labeling is needed and so now the biotech industry has gotten the government the u.s government to come up with another term because the word gmo now has a bad rap non-gmo has become preferred so now they've been mandated okay let's have a labeling law but let's make it so hard to label so hard for, for consumers to figure out what's going on. Let's put a QR code that you have to scan with your phone in the aisles and then sort through a website to figure out the deal and then do that by 100 items in your grocery. You'll never get to it. And if you want to put something on the thing, let's call it BE. BE with a nice happy face and a sun. A BE. Is it like someone misspelled the word B? No, it means bioengineered. So no one knows the term bioengineered. So we did a contest at the Institute for Responsible Technology. What should BE really be called? And the winner was buy elsewhere. So, <laughs> so, so really, I mean, the process of laboratory manipulation of GMO, of, of genes in a way that could not be accomplished through natural means will define GMO, genetic, genetically modified organism, which is the result of genetic engineering. And we also use the word genetic modification. And if you want bioengineering, they also call it biofortified because they try and put a smiley face on it. So all of that, all of that is, is artificially forcing changes in the DNA. And we thought we knew what the DNA did, but it turns out Genes act as families and networks. So you create a single change here and you can create tons of changes and not know. And I'll give you one example because you talked about future generations and I didn't respond to that. This is, this is just epigenetics. Epigenetics is how do we get those genes to express? And so let's say you have a whole orchestra. Each one, each piece of instrument is a different gene. Well, they're just hanging around waiting for the conductor to cue them. So how do we get the oboe or the, the string section to express? A lot of that is the epigenetics, what happens in the cell to allow the genes to express their protein. Well, epigenetics, we didn't know for years, can be inherited. Now check this out. This Dr. Skinner in Washington University, uh, in, University State, in the Washington State University, injected Roundup into pregnant rats. Those rats did fine, their offspring did fine, the grandchildren suffered. And who suffered more? The great-grandchildren, 90 
percent of them had serious diseases in the prostate and the kidneys, obese. A lot, most of the mother rats died while giving birth. Some of the kids gave birth, so they had reproductive problems in the great grandchildren compared to the controls. And they found the epigenetic change in the sperm cell. So they could show why this one, do one dose of Roundup was being passed on to future generations. What are we doing? What year was glyphosate first used? Because that would be, we're almost coming into that time period right now where we're looking at the, the third generation or the fourth generation. Or, and we're already seeing massive changes in epigenetics and genes. And um, what does it look like for people that have been exposed to atrazine or glyphosate or been eating GMO foods in the next, like what is your prediction for the next, let's say three to five years? What do you feel is gonna happen? And I, and, and I, I, I wanna touch on one other subject that you talked about. I know Netflix is coming out with a show yeah, yeah. Um, and it's talking about you can order all this stuff online. Like you can, it's the CRISPR technology and you have people in garages that are doing gene uh, editing and gene splicing and like growing ears in their arms and stuff like that. I mean, this, this can be out of control. I mean, uh, to me, it's already way out of control. Can you expand on the three to five years, what you see, and then also touch more on wh what's going on with all these individuals just doing all this gene stuff in their garages? All right, so I think your question is brilliant because I was talking to Dr. Skinner as a live Facebook who did this epigenetic test. And I do a lot of interviews with scientists who find the actual results and they post them or do live onto our Facebook at the Institute for Responsible Technology. And he said that DDT can cause obesity in future generations and that we're already experiencing the obesity from the DDT because um, we had massive exposures from our grandparents, et cetera, and parents. So we're already seeing the folly expressed Perhaps that was a theory and we need to verify it. Um, what happened when GMOs were introduced into the food supply, Dr. Michelle Perra was in the movie Secret Ingredients, uh, describes how the, the children that she was seeing as a pediatrician in starting in early 2000s, after being exposed, you see the introduced GMOs in Roundup 1996, heavy, I mean, Glyphosate was an herbicide back in the 70s, but it started to get used a lot in 1996 on the Roundup Ready crops, engineered by Monsanto, seeds that will withstand their patented Roundup herbicide on the fields. You can spray right over the top of the fields. You don't have to spot spray the weeds. So it was a way of weeding easier for farmers, and it gets saturated, driven into the plants, driven into the food portion. We end up eating it. And the GMOs themselves create all sorts of damage to the, to the system. So she was seeing the results in early 2000 where all these diseases started to rise in the children in the United States that had never been so prevalent, cancers and complicated digestive issues. And the same old treatments were not working. And she happened to be reading one of my books and got this alarm and said, oh my God, this is what's happening. She looked at actually a, a picture of the intestines and the stomach of rats that had been fed GMOs and go, this is what's happening to our children. And then started to put them on organic diets and then they got better. So she's written a book, What's Making Our Children Sick. And she's been experimenting and getting people healthy, in some cases, just by putting them on an organic diet. And I mentioned earlier, this is really, this is relating to both what you said earlier and also three to five years. Here's the point about infertility. In the film, Secret Ingredients, we have kids who are autistic, parents switch to organic diet, they're no longer on the spectrum. People who had cancer, people who had skin conditions, um, mood disorders, brain fog, and we explain why. We explain the modes of action of GMOs and Roundup and why they could be messing up the gut bacteria, the neurotransmitters, the mitochondria, the hormones. All these things are explained with beautiful animation. So it's not like those that are against, that can't deal with science or are lost. So we, we spell it out. One person decided to create a protocol in her chiropractic office for infertile couples 
in addition to chiropractic, which alone never gets this result. She put everyone on an organic diet. At the, by the end of the film, and this is kind of a, a plot spoiler, but it's okay. 92 couples who came to her infertile. Some of them had gone to fertility clinics. Some of them had been diagnosed with specific problems. Some, they couldn't find the problems, but they could not have children. 92 couples now have children. The number of couples that came to her that followed her program, protocol that didn't have children, zero. 100% success rate. And I've spoken to her since, and at that point it was 123 successes, no failures. So what is Roundup? What are, what are GMOs doing to our bodies? I started asking people in 2012 at conferences, what have you noticed when you switched to non-GMO or organic? Did you notice improvements in health? All these hands shot up. I'd say, what did you notice? And people would say, oh, the, my inflammatory bowel disease is gone, or my blood sugar is stabilized, or my blood pressure is down. And I'd say, how many others have noticed this? And I started getting a sense of the room. I spoke at doctor's conferences. Tell me about your patients. Each doctor was talking about one or 2,000 patients that they put on a different diet. So we had a pretty big sample. Then I did it again and again. About 150 lectures, maybe two dozen of them, doctor's conferences. And we were seeing the exact same thing. The same, I wrote them down, 28 different conditions. Always digestive disorders were at the top. Then fatigue and brain fog, weight problems, anxiety, depression, uh, allergies, food sensitivities, chronic pain, skin conditions, and including down to autism, Alzheimer's, and all these things. And so we surveyed 3,256 people, same thing, same results that we saw in 150 lectures. These, this bundle of diseases are the common diseases that we're seeing. And if you look at the epidemiological data, they're on the rise since 1996, when GMOs and Roundup in the food supply took off. If you look at autism, and you look at autism in six-year-olds, and you compare it to the amount of glyphosate that's been released over the pr that and previous three years, the line, the correlation is almost exact. Now, correlation doesn't prove causation. We both know that. But when you see the modes of action and see that Glyphosate can mess up the microbiome, damage the mitochondria, you know, allow, bind with minerals, making them unavailable, create leaky gut, mess up the serotonin, melatonin, and dopamine, turn, turn the hormones uh, haywire, create cancer by creating genotoxicity, damage in the DNA, create birth defects, that it can reduce the ability for the liver to detox, reduce the ability for the cells to detox. And, and, and damage the way that the cells talk to each other, I have just named the foundations of health. There's very few other things that have so many different diseases associated with them, and Roundup does them all. And then you have GMOs on top of that, and then the Bt toxin insecticide produced by some GMOs on top of that. No wonder it is probably the biggest driver of ill health in the United States, possibly in the world. So no wonder when people switch to organic, which doesn't allow GMOs or Roundup, and you mentioned atrazine, the great hormone disruptor, then you end up seeing health like you've never seen before, and people become evangelical organic eaters because they realize they've been suffering for decades unnecessarily because of the food they've been eating. I think thanks to you, we've seen all those lawsuits for glyphosate. I mean, in your opinion, do you feel like things, more and more people, I, I think more and more people are being educated on, on GMOs, thanks to you and thanks to everybody else that is getting better. But at the same time, I see a lot of diversions around all that. And is there, I know you talked about the bacteria. Is there anything that people should be looking for that might be hidden uh, in the foods or, or anything in the next you know, few years that you can educate us on that we don't already know about right now? Great question. Uh, let's talk about some of the new GMOs. Um, you know, for years people, well, you know, with DNA, the genes create RNA, which is kind of like a single-stranded mirror of the DNA, and then that 
codes for proteins and or amino acids and the amino acids get folded up into proteins. Okay, there was 20 years of science right there. If you didn't catch it, don't worry about it. Now, so the, the, the whole concept was, oh, the RNA, it's just a way station. It's just like, hand me the code from the DNA, hand it over to the protein, we're done. Okay, we can go and take the day off. RNA was treated as nothing. It turns out RNA is one of those conductors of the orchestra. It's saying, okay, let's have these genes express, and now these genes, and now lower these genes. It's part of what helps us regulate, express, and live in the world. Now, the DNA produces strands of RNA, but so do food crops. So, and so when we eat food, it turns out it's not just vitamins and minerals and phytonutrients, it's also RNA. The bacteria in our gut produce RNA. It's part of the crosstalk. It's part of the intelligence of nature, intelligence of food, intelligence of the microorganisms that help regulate our health. Now, this has been figured out by the biotech industry and immediately they pounce upon it to try and corrupt it for their own good and this is what they've done. They've introduced apples and potatoes engineered with RNA, it, the DNA produces an RNA, it folds upon itself, so it's a double-stranded RNA, and it goes, it's kind of like a hunt and destroy mission. It looks for a certain code that it can hook up with in the DNA of the apple and potato, and it silences that gene. That gene normally produces the elements in the organism that cause browning. So you have non-browning apples called Botox apples, they lie about their age. You can't tell how long it's been sliced. And so you can sell pre-sliced apples. You go on Amazon, pre-sliced apples, they're probably the Arctic apple genetically engineered. P potatoes, they don't bruise. So all these potatoes that are normally thrown out because they're bruised and have fungus growing on them and mycotoxins, they're now in the supermarket because you can't tell that they're bruised. You cut them and there's no, there's no browning. Now, what happens is, that RNA is hanging out in the food, and we eat it. You feed double-stranded RNA to mice, and it changes their gene expression. They fed one meal of double-stranded RNA to honeybees, and then checked them weeks later and found out it had changed over 1,400 genes. One meal of double-stranded RNA. Now we're eating the apple and potato. I talked to a former USDA scientist who wrote a peer-reviewed article saying, we don't have the ability to evaluate the impact of these RNAs that we release because they can affect non-target organisms, read humans. And I interviewed him and when he published it, he was forced out of the USDA because they are pro-GMO by design and by mandate. And he was basically saying, this stuff is too dangerous. So if you eat the apple or potato, you might reprogram your own DNA expression, but it gets worse. There's now spraying, sprays that have been approved with RNA, designed to reprogram genetic expression in the crops or the insects that it touches. So now we're looking at a new class because the old pesticides and herbicides are failing. They wanna use RNA-based pesticides or sprays and they're introducing new types of GMOs like this as well. Another thing, when you cut a gene, the cellular mechanism of the DNA reattaches it. And when it does that, you don't have any control as to how it works. It might cause mutations, it might grab DNA from the nearby environment. A article was just written by uh, Jonathan Latham that they found that cow DNA and goat DNA got into mice because the sera that they used in the Petri dish was from cows and goats. And what was in there, including jumping dream genes called retrotransposons, which can jump throughout the DNA, and retroviruses. So you had cow and goat retroviruses. You know what a retrovirus is, a virus that works itself into the DNA, like HIV. Cow retroviruses are being incorporated into the DNA of these mice, 
and there was there was these hornless cows. They genetically engineered hornless cows. Published the article in 2016. This is a great success. It is so successful. There are no side effects. It means we should never regulate gene editing animals ever again because of this one example. This was the theory. This was the propaganda. And they started producing these in a farm in Brazil until the FDA just this year published the sequence and said, guess what, guys, you missed something. There's bacteria DNA inside the cow genes that you totally missed. It was bacteria that was used during the gene editing process. And guess what? It has antibiotic resistant genes, which can create antibiotic resistant pathogens. Soon after that, just this week, there was an article published that the antibiotic resistant genes used in 130 types of GMOs, different, different categories that were approved, not that many species on the environment, but on, the, on the food, so don't worry about, not everything is genetically engineered, but antibiotic resistant genes, you eat them in the GMOs, you poop them out, they go into wastewater treatment plants, and a certain percentage of that antibiotic resistant genes survive. And then they gather that food solids and spread them on fields, because half of them are spread on fields, and now you have now introduced into the environment antibiotic resistant genes that we also see in the same experiment get incorporated into pathogenic bacteria, which now can resist antibiotics and become super diseases. And there's tens of thousands of deaths and more amputations because of these antibiotic resistant diseases, which are probably promoted because of these GMOs. So when you say what's going to be in the food, what's going to be in our crops, it's already here. And there's things that I absolutely do not know about um, because it's, a lot of it's hidden and, and secret. But as we discover, it's not just in the food. You know, there's a company, Oxitec, introduced mosquitoes. This is going to lower the population of this particular mosquito, which carries dengue fever and Zika. Well, they did a study and found, guess what, guys? It didn't lower the population. It didn't reduce it. And you guys said, Oxitec, that it would self-eliminate that because it's just creating sterile offspring and it would never persist in the environment. Well, in Brazil, where they released billions of mosquitoes, 10 to 60% of the samples found these combinations of genes from the genetically engineered mosquito and the natural population and everything they were promised by Oxitec was a lie. It's changing the ecosystem. It's changing the gene pool forever. And I remember talking to one of the scientists that we had both testified for and against these mosquitoes in Key West because they want to release them in Florida. And I said to him privately, you know, your female mosquitoes bite humans and the saliva gets into the skin, gets into the bloodstream. Have you tested it? He says, we're just now testing to see if the gene that's inserted into the mosquito produces a protein that's found in the saliva. And I'm thinking, you're a little late, buddy. You've already released millions of mosquitoes in four countries. So then I enlightened him. I said, you know, it's not just that protein. When you insert a gene, like they did in a human cell, they found it wasn't just that protein that changed. It changed the whole orchestra. 5% of the genes that were expressing changed their levels of expression with a single gene. Shouldn't you be looking at the entire component of the saliva and his response was brilliant. He said, good idea. These are the people that we're trusting the future of the genome of all species with. These are the brain cells behind genetic engineering, completely inept. And yet, what's going to come in a few years? Well, hopefully, you talked about three to five years, hopefully, we're going to usher out from the food supply roundup. We're going to usher out GMOs. We're going to contain the GMO threat, which is what I'm working on, what the Institute for Responsible Technology is working on. So what our future holds depends on what we do now, obviously, but we're really at a decision point. Wow. I mean, this is a serious, this is really a serious topic. Um, it's been serious for me too, because uh, working with patients for over 20 years, uh, in realizing that everything starts in the gut, like all disease begins in the gut and all health begins in the gut as well, you realize and, and analyze all of the different toxic compounds that come into the body. And we haven't even talked about how the 
pesticides and herbicides and, and GMOs react with all of the other chemicals and toxins from the air yeah. that people are consuming and the other preservatives and things from the food and all the other bacteria and things that people are exposed to and the, and the fungus and the mold and all that other stuff. It's, it's really a toxic slew that people are consuming that no one really knows how all of this is transpiring in, in, in all these creations and all this stuff that's happening. And then you throw in the, the, the uh, geoengineering and the chemtrails and all of the stuff that, that is affecting the soils around the world as well. And, so, and, and before, you, before you get off that beautiful point about the combination, I just want to tell you what we do know, and there's a, mostly we don't know. But glyphosate is the so-called active ingredient. The companies allow them, the EPA says, you tell us what we should require you to test and submit your data for. And of course, they they've been found to fraudulently submit the wrong data. But it's, it's even worse. It says, okay, we're going to call glyphosate the only poison in Roundup. And then we're going to actually test glyphosate, but not even the glyphosate that's found in Roundup. We're going to test a different form of glyphosate that's actually less harmful. And then we're going to submit that to you. And of course, even then they submitted information, which is probably fraudulent. So it turns out that Roundup as a whole, it contains ingredients there that are, that are t more toxic than glyphosate, in one case, 10,000 times more toxic, that are more uh, damaging to the hormones. So when you test Roundup as a whole, it's, can, it's up to 125 times more toxic, but that's not required to be tested by the EPA. Uh, and the second thing is, there was a study that just came out on mouse cancer, breast cancer cells, and they put glyphosate in with the cells, and there was no change. Then they added one thing that's found in every cell of the human body, and then the breast cancer cells started to grow. So on its own, the glyphosate didn't do it, but in combination, which is never required to be tested, you have a mechanism for how cancer grows and why the breast cancer rate in the United States seems to follow the increase in the US, in the, in the US use of, of Roundup on GMO crops as do many other cancers. So yeah, I just wanted to stop you there because we have enough information to verify by numbers what you're talking about. Thank you. So let's talk about some of the solutions that people can, can, can do. I mean, if they're suffering from, I, I, I say any condition, whether it's a mental condition, whether uh, it's gut issues, whether it's cancer, whether it's heart disease, whatever, Let's say that you've been consuming GMOs. Most people eat in restaurants. They don't realize there's a lot of GMOs there as well. The children, um, we're seeing just when you combine the, the dietary habits with the vaccinations, with all of the other uh, things that children are consuming. Like if, if someone said, I'm just sick and tired of all this, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired, what would you recommend that they do? Obviously eating organic, but do you have a system saying that we know that if you do this, that the body can repair itself very rapidly and you can recover from the damage of consuming the glyphosate and the GMOs? It's an excellent question. Well, first I wanna give hope to those people who may not have the ability to do any other intervention. Uh, if just by switching to organic, uh, a non-GMO, 85.2% of our 3,256 people reported getting better from digestive disorders. And I think you know more than nearly anyone the preeminence of the digestive tract in so many other diseases. Um, <clears throat> and that the reversal actually works very quickly for many people. Not everyone, and you're right, there's certain people that that's not going to do it alone. So I have been asked this question by audiences for more than a decade. What more can I do? And my answer four years was always the same. It's above my pay grade. I'm not a, I'm not a scientist. I'm not a practitioner, a healer. Um, but I, been at, I started to listen to other doctors who it's not above their pay grade. Dietrich Klinghardt, I watched him give a protocol on glyphosate removal. And I talked to uh, people have created um, something that reduced the amount of glyphosate in the urine and people that put glyphosate into petri dishes and block and, and reattached the tight junctions between the cells that glyphosate had destroyed. Um, just interviewed a group that had a product that, that reversed the 
reduction of the NRF2, which is the thing that, which is why glyphosate is like the king of all toxins, because it actually prevents the cells from releasing other toxins. And how they had shown also that the intercellular communication, which is the gap junctions, that that actually was damaged by 50% from glyphosate. But when they put their product in, it actually supported, it actually restored that so that there was no loss. So I say that although I'm not qualified to answer your question, and I am qualified to ask the questions, overqualified. So I actually assembled many of these people in a Healing from GMOs and Roundup online conference in the summer of 2018. And that's, we're making that available very shortly. But I'm also introducing updates and new information. So what I can say is it's too much, like some people will say, let's do a, uh, uh, an infrared detox. Let's make sure the water is purified. Let's uh, put humic acid and fulvic acid so we can mineralize and cause and 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 chelate the the glyphosate out of the body. Let's rebuild the microbiome because that's damaged because glyphosate is an antibiotic and it damages the beneficial bacteria, which makes it a weird antibiotic because it's selective. It's the most. It's maybe the worst, and it's throughout our food supply. Then there's people that talk about okay, let's fix the intercellular communication, restore the, the, the liver um, detoxification because it messes up that. So it's basically everything that you know about in terms of detoxing, rebuilding and repairing. And we pull people together, experts to say, okay, this is what we look for, both clinical research and, and actual bench research so we can verify rather than just it's a good idea. And so we assemble those and I do live Facebooks and I do webinars and whatnot. But for me to choose a, pro a set of protocols and select out of that, I'm gonna say that is above my pay grade. I, what I do is I'll interview someone on my own and hear and read the research and go, okay, there's enough information here that I feel confident that my listeners and readers will wanna know. But I can never say this is better than that because I don't have the degrees behind my I have my, my film, <laughs> Secret Ingredients, behind my head. You've got the degrees behind your head. I say your audience needs to go to you to determine what the stages are. Do you do the rebuilding before you do the detoxing? Do you clear what are the stages? And I may put you in front of my audience, you know, so that you can tell them as well. But yes, there are things to do. There are ways to get better. And so I'll throw it back to you if you have to, if you want to share with your audience something because that's above my pay grade. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, what we've been teaching for years is, is address the root cause of the situation that you're dealing with, number one, and become educated about it. We used to ask all of our patients all the time and still today, you know, can you explain to me why you have gut issues? Can you explain to me why you have cancer? Can you explain to me why you have diabetes? And Almost every single time they say, no, I don't know why. And so the first thing we would do is explain to them why they have it. It's like being in a, I'm not going to rewire my electricity in my house because I don't know anything about electricity. I'm not an electrician. But what we found is by explaining to individuals the root cause of why they have their condition, which is the accumulation of chemicals and toxins from the food, air, water, et cetera. And not only that, the environment in which they live and the toxic emotions, a flip switches in their mind and, and they become more hopeful and they become more educated and they become more knowledgeable, which gives them the confidence level that they need to move forward and, and make those decisions like, well, I'm not going to, I know the damage that this can cause me by eating GMOs. So now I'm going to make that conscious decision to not eat GMOs. So, and then we just run them through that whole detoxification process and that whole educational process. And I mean, I know all the, the same doctors you're talking of and everybody has slightly different right. methods and techniques, but ultimately the most successful doctors are doing just that because a doctor is a teacher first, not a prescriber. And then uh, pretty much everybody will talk about detoxification and cleansing because we all have a self-healing mechanism and it's all about reactivating the body's own self-healing mechanism. So yeah. thank you for sharing all that information with us. Um, is, there, is there anything that we haven't talked about that you'd like to add before we close out today? You know, it's interesting as you were talking, it reminded me of that great panel we did at TTAC where there were all these, you and I and all these different um, experts were talking. And one of the conclusions 
uh, that we talked about was taking responsibility for our own health. And what you just talked about in terms of being an educator helps not only with their health, but it helps counteract what I call the epidemic of thinking that things are other people's responsibility. That's why we have GMOs, because people think, oh, it's other people's responsibility to figure out that it's safe, to you know, figure out what I should eat. So this is even institutionalized. If you look at the document that the FDA created about GMO policy, it was written by Michael Taylor, Monsanto's former attorney, who later became Monsanto's vice president. It says that the agency does not approve GMOs. And we don't even need to know if, some, if a company wants to put a GMO on the market, they can determine that themselves. They can determine it themselves. They can evaluate whether their GMOs are safe or not. We just talked about earlier how Monsanto's own scientists refused to drink milk from cows treated with bovine growth hormone, we, how the, the, it damaged the mice, and, and so they rewrote the study to hide the effects. So they're not protecting us. The FDA is not protecting us. And I've spoken in 45 countries, and I often speak to regulators and government officials, and they say, we don't have to evaluate GMOs because the FDA does it. So the FDA is not doing it. They say we don't have to do it because Monsanto does it. Monsanto doesn't do it. In fact, if you look at how they have actually uh, evaluated their products, it is absolutely appalling and, in my opinion, criminal. So that's in terms of the food. But it really is institutionalized in our educational system in terms of giving away our power, giving away our power. And now when we look at how corporations are often running the show in Washington, and it's not new, this administration, it's been going on, then we also have this sense of hopelessness, someone else is responsible. And I wanna, this is pretty critical. This concept of being hopeless is the epidemic, which is at the source of so many social problems and personal diseases. So, I would like to suggest that in two ways, we've talked about two ways, getting your health back, in this case, in terms of your diet, so that you decide what you consider food and what you consider food-shaped objects that you don't want to put in your mouth. You decide and not let the biotech industry or their enforcement wing in Washington decide. And then we turn being a victim into a victor, so that we say, I'm going to determine for my family what is real food, and I'm going to make the choices that will not only affect us, but will help change the food supply by investing so that the money, the monetary investment is both your food budget, your health budget, as well as your philanthropy budget, because you're making changes with every dollar that you spend to help support a better agriculture. So that's one thing. And secondly, that you think in terms of beyond food, in terms of what we talked about at the beginning, you know, when we think about how do we save all living beings and all future generations, the first instantaneous result from so many people is someone else's responsibility. I hope they fix it. It's not my problem, but I'm rooting for them. That's where another aspect of this epidemic is. I would say flip it and say, what can I do? How can I be responsible? At this point, for most people, it's contributing, it's donating. And we'd be happy at the Institute for Responsible Technology to be your action figures, to be out there being the superheroes that you introduce, doing what we need to do, gathering the resources, alerting the different groups, building a global movement from those that are already concerned so that everyone, whether someone is focused on climate chaos or they're focused on saving the oceans, we can say, guess what? This thing about replacing nature, this threat, it's not our responsibility and not yours. It's everyone's responsibility. If you listen carefully, you can hear all living beings and all future generations whispering, please help us. I, I listened to this poem at Bioneers this past weekend um, from Drew Dellinger, and it's something like at 3.23 a.m., I could not sleep because I was, I was being kept awake by my great, great grandchildren. And they said, what did you do when the world was, when you knew that the world was unraveling? What did you do once you knew? And so now that we know that the world can unravel, but we can't let it, I want to suggest that we use this opportunity to change this epidemic, not just in food, not just in the environment, not just with GMOs, but to really say, okay, I'm living my life now, myself and my family, and let's go forward 
with a new way of living and looking at life and, and inspiring others to do the same because this becomes, instead of the epidemic, the antidote. So I think you and I discussed this on stage. It was a fantastic panel that had that energy. And I think that let's leave this conversation, which from the one hand sounds gloom and doom, but from the other hand, it's like so handleable. My God, it is so handleable. Well, there's always a solution for every situation. And thank you so much for sharing all that information with us today. Uh, I just, it's, it's time to bring this to the forefront and let people know that we need help. We need people to help out. We need to get the information out, share this video, share this information with as many people as you can. That doesn't take too much time to share a video with your list. Let people know to go to responsibletechnology.org make a donation. This is for the future of the planet. This is for the future of food, the future of agriculture. We don't know how it's going to end up, but we all have a positive attitude about it. We're doing something about it. We're contributing to the greater good of educating the masses about the damaging effects this can cause. And I mean, who wants to see all this stuff happen? I mean, I have two kids uh, that are GMO free, our family's GMO free, but I look around and I get calls every single day from mothers crying on the phone, from individuals suffering from all these different conditions and diseases. And it, it all stems from what's going on in the environment, what's going on in the food supply, what's going on with all these synthetic man-made chemicals that are being sprayed in the air and being you know added to all of the foods and all these synthetic compounds and prescription medications. So we would really appreciate any help that you can give us to spread this information or to donate again to responsibletechnology.org and go to protectnaturenow.com as well and look at and share not only the information on Jeffrey's site, but genetic roulette and, and support Jeffrey's efforts for all of his movies that he's producing, Secret Ingredients share all that, give it away for gifts. I mean, we have the holiday season coming up. So anyway, thanks again, Jeffrey, for tuning in today, for sharing all this awesome information. You are a superhero in my eyes. Uh, I just, I can't thank you enough for everything that you've done for the planet and for so many different individuals and all of us doctors out there, giving us the information to share with all of our tribes and patients and people that want to help change uh, their own lives. And it's all about creating positive change in people's lives. So thanks again for coming on today. And I want to say, Ed, you really model this of taking responsibility so well. I mean, you have completely enacted whatever you understand to be true. You share with others. I told you about our own personal crisis at the Institute. You said, let me make a donation. And you immediately made a donation. You said, let me bring you on to share with, to share this information and this appeal to our to our listeners. So you are someone that is living and modeling that's taking responsibility. So on behalf of all those that have been listening and being inspired by you, thank you. All right. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it.